Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Blight. I am uh, uh, delightfully located today in the mezzanine again of the Beinecke Library at Yale. A uh, magnificent place to uh, hang out, have lunch, and I will do that in a moment. Um, this is uh, one in our many uh, Wednesday, we used to call them brown bag uh, talks, and now we're just calling them Wednesday talks at the GLC. Although there's news afloat now that Yale is going to be doing some reopening by the summer, so uh, by after the month of May, hopefully we will do some things in person. Can you all believe that? Let's get on with today's program. Let's get right to the point here. Um, Crystal Webster is our current full semester fellow at the GLC, although because of pandemic, she of course had to stay home in San Antonio. She has full access to the uh, library's digital uh, platforms, which are very considerable, including here in the Beinecke. Um, she's a historian of race, gender, and childhood in particular. Uh, at the University of Texas at San Antonio, where she's assistant professor of history and African American studies. She did her PhD, I'm happy to say, at UMass Amherst, a place I used to live right next to for about 13 years. Uh, her first book, which comes out, I believe, in June from UNC Press, which means it's finished. Probably it's out of your hands, Crystal, and there's nothing left you can do to it, right? <laughs> <laughs> is called Beyond the Boundaries of Childhood, African-American Children in the Antebellum North. Her newest project, which is what she's going to speak on today, is what she's researching now, is called Criminalizing Freedom, African-Americans and the Making of Criminal Reform in Early America. Crystal, it's great to have you here. We wish you we had you in person. But uh, this is the this is the best we can do, and it works pretty well. So over to you, Crystal, and welcome. Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you to the audience for being here today. And I'm so honored to be able to conduct this research during a pandemic and have access to the extensive digitized archives at Yale and the Gilbert that the that the Gilder Lerman Center also has to offer virtually. Criminalizing Freedom, African-Americans and the Making of Criminal Reform in Early America is a historical monograph that chronicles the experiences of African-Americans in the criminal court systems and prisons of early America in places where they experienced harsh and racialized treatment and really at the moment that these penitentiaries were first established primarily in the North. And it focuses especially on African-American women and children and the ways in which ideas of race and crime converged around constructions of gender and age. So this is brand new research. It's in its very early stages and again, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to be at this stage um, of research and to be gathering materials here at Yale and conversing with such an esteemed scholarly community. This research emerged out of my first book, Beyond the Boundaries of Childhood, African-American Children in the Antebellum North. And this, this book produces a social history of African-American children during this period of immense social and historical change. So I'm really looking at the intersections of Northern emancipation and changing ideas of childhood. It focuses on black children's contested negotiation of newly recognized spaces for children, including schools, juvenile reformatories and orphanages. And in this project, I write about how white reformers consistently observed and remarked upon the destitute conditions that they described black children were exposed to and including how many of them observed and wrote about discovering black children in adult prisons. So after doing more digging on this phenomenon, I uncovered prison records which supported their observation 
and was horrified to see that Black children were present in adult prisons, not in small numbers, any number would be horrific, but that the numbers of Black children in some places were almost one third of all African Americans who were incarcerated. And also, as we know, African Americans, even at this point, were incarcerated and imprisoned at disproportionate numbers to the population. Scholars of the criminal reform movement know this and have also remarked on the presence of Black children in early prisons, but with less attention to the category of age and changing ideas and treatment of children. And indeed, some prisoners did not categorize prisoners by age. So these records um, that do are very rich and important to this history. I centralized the disproportionate presence of African Americans and of note Black children as central to understanding the process of the origins of the criminal reform movement. While criminalizing freedom is inspired by the presence of Black children in adult prisons, it also seeks to examine the formation of the criminal reform movement and its treatment of all African Americans. So I have a, a rough overview of what the project um, seeks to do, which is to look at the roots of the movement of the criminal reform movement in the North and the sites for the first prisons and penitentiaries, and not only the ways in which African-Americans were racialized as particularly criminal, represented by their disproportionate sentencing, but to also understand how and why African Americans were excluded from the rehabilitative ideals of criminal reform. So this is especially pronounced when we look at black children who are in adult prisons, even after juvenile reformatories were established. Other African Americans were also removed entirely from society through executions and lifetime sentences in order or in place of rehabilitation. In order to understand how ideas of crime and reform excluded African Americans, I begin with criminal confessions and crime narratives of the early national period and the colonial era, many that were co coerced and then published as crime narratives to widespread appeal and then sensationalized. So for example, one that I look at is a rather well-known narrative of an African-American man, Joseph Mountain, who was condemned to death for attempted rape in 1790 during a time in which such a crime did not require execution. So this first chapter connects these criminal confessions to the most extreme cases of racial criminal exclusion, which is the criminalization of black children. So in the second chapter, I examine executions, harsh sentencing, and sensationalization of Black children's crimes. I'm also very interested in the abolitionist movement's role and response to criminal reform, particularly the tension between advocating for equal treatment in criminal reform and a right for rehabilitation, and then balancing that against racist associations that were already emerging between African Americans and criminality. So there were both attempts by abolitionists to argue that African Americans and African American children should be in these institutions, which were seen as more benevolent opportunities for reform, but then to explain why they were there in such large numbers and to understand the racialization of crime that was already happening. And then I'm also focusing on Black women and children who gave birth or who were born into institutions, as well as those who were imprisoned in the earliest penitentiaries. So some of the women who were imprisoned were still enslaved and their children that they gave birth to were then sold into slavery. And finally, I hope to directly connect the origins of the criminal reform movement in the North 
to the rise of mass incarceration in the post-emancipation South. So with this, my project is in conversation with scholars of Black history, as well as those of childhood and crime and criminal reform, including Wilma King, Robin Bernstein, Tara Agyapong, Sarah Haley, Talitha Laforia, Jeff Ward, and Khalil Jabran Muhammad, to name a few. So in my focus of chi on childhood, I look at how childhood evolved during the 19th century and that children were progressively considered to be innocent and fragile and socially protected. During this period, the labor of white children declined and their schooling increased, but this evolving treatment of children excluded black children who were increasingly represented as socially deviant, were criminalized, were legally enslaved and indentured. At the same time, during the late 18th century, Northern and gradual emancipation potentially altered the status of African Americans, but this process specified freedom based on age. And African American children remained enslaved and indentured until they reached adulthood. Scholars like Jen Mannion have carefully traced the history of the establishment of carceral culture and effectively connect the rise of prisons to efforts to control marginalized groups, including women, the working poor, and newly emancipated African Americans. And similarly, Callie Gross examines the ways in which Black women were, quote, marked as immoral, coarse, and unwomanly as part of Philadelphia's criminal reform movement. So I take up these themes explored in the existing scholarship but with a specific focus on African Americans prior to and during the birth of criminal reform as marked by their presence in penitentiaries and harsh sentencing practices. So this is new research, but I do wanna share a few examples from a chapter that I have drafted on the criminalization of black children. The project begins with the case of Hannah Okuish. In the summer of 1786, a jury in the Connecticut town of New London condemned Hannah Okuish, a young girl of African and Pequot heritage to death after the murder of a young white child. Her trial and sentencing were significant not only because of the severity of her punishment, her execution by hanging, but also because Hannah was only 12 years old, making her the youngest known person in US history to be sentenced to death and hanged. Reverend Channing performed a sermon at Hannah's execution. This is an image of the sermon in order to warn children and parents of Hannah's wicked ways. The text has been considered by some to be an accurate portrayal of the incident and Hannah's behavior, but it is far from objective. Channing described Okuish as exhibiting, quote, maliciousness and cruelty of her disposition, including an artful cunning beyond many of her years. In this way, Channing adultified Okuish or treated her or deprived her, as her of her childhood, treating her as an adult as did other observers of her behavior who remarked upon a lack of emotion from Hannah as evidence of her guilt. Later, following a shift away from capital punishment by the early 19th century to the imprisonment of all populations, including black children, a sizable portion of black girls were some of the only children imprisoned and sentenced to life at newly established institutions. White children were consistently not present at these institutions at, in adult prisons and were later accepted to juvenile reformatories like the first reformatory established for children in the New York House of Refuge. And then in the wake of gradual emancipation, three more black children two girls were executed in New Jersey 
James Guild in 1828, Jane Huff in 1837, and Roseanne Keene in 1844. And these extreme punishments of Black children, their convictions to death, lifetime sentences, and presence in adult prisons coincided with the gradual emancipation of enslaved persons in each of the places in which they lived, in Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. The process and the movements, which should have increased protections for, for Black children, instead increased their criminalization. And this chapter that I um, am sharing research from is from an article also that's currently under review with the Journal of the Early Republic. And this article is titled, Hanging Pretty Girls. So I just wanna share a bit from this article to give you a sense of why it has this title and the kind of um, grotesque sensationalization and criminalization that I'm looking at. When Roseanne King, Roseanne Keen, a young enslaved girl, was charged with killing her enslaver in 1843 in New Jersey. She was convicted of poisoning his porridge and mental incompet incompetence was used to appeal the death sentence, but to no avail. She was hanged in 1848. Prior to that, the Philadelphia Mercury published an article concerning Keene's execution titled Hanging Pretty Girls. The paper remarked on the, quote, pity of spoiling such an elegant piece of nature's workmanship and asked its readers, could not her punishment be commuted to kissing death instead of strangulation? And this grotesque treatment of Cain in the press simultaneously sexualized her and infantilized her both as pretty and as a girl. Such representations denied black women and girls the protective associations of true respectable womanhood and playful innocent childhood. Gendered as girls, but marginalized as children, black girls provoked fear and outrage when they resisted subjugation and threatened social control and hierarchies of power centered around the institution of slavery. Their harsh sentences indicate that white society favored their complete removal over the prospect of reforming them and allowing them to grow up to adulthood. These executions and subsequent adultification and sexualization in the press worked to neutralize white fear and to maintain racial and gendered hierarchies. In New York, African-Americans generally, but also black girls specifically, were imprisoned at starkly disproportionate rates to the state prison of New York or Newgate, which opened in 1797. Statistical data from a review of the institution found that African-Americans constituted one third of the number of total prisoners while being just one twentieth of the entire state's population. In 1800, for the records that I look at, I found that five out of 15 incarcerated black women were actually not women at all, but were children under the age of 17. Some of these children received extremely harsh punishments, including Harriet Monroe, who was 17 years old and had been arrested and sentenced for burglary for life at Newgate prison. Here I also show four other black girls, Dinah, Hannah Ellis, Jenny and Mary Williams, who were all sentenced and imprisoned at Newgate and were all age 13. So for this fellowship, I'll be examining these types of sources, as well as sources from abolitionist societies, the American Anti-Slavery Society, sources from Black abolitionists and the Colored Conventions Movement, as well as prison records from the Prison Association of New York, the Prison Reform Society, and the New York House of Refuge and Auburn Prisons. I'll also be looking at confessions and 
prime narrative to understand representations of Black criminality in the press of early America. I'll also be examining texts and records from these institutions, particularly the newly discovered memoir of Austin Reed, a semi-autobiographical account of imprisonment from an African-American man who was sentenced to New York's House of Refuge as a child and then later Auburn prison. With this project, I seek to show how the criminal reform movement, which ostensibly sought reform and rehabilitation for all criminal classes, instead preferred complete removal of African-Americans at the moment they were to be emancipated. This was especially extreme for Black women and girls, and they experienced capital punishment and lifetime in prison at places and times when white women and girls were increasingly protected and not receiving such sentences. Sentencing procedures which treated Black children as adults or place them in adult prisons in conjunction with the sensationalization of black criminal extreme violence in the press cemented associations between blackness and criminalization at the moment of African-Americans birth in their childhoods even. These ideas became fully enmeshed with an American social understanding of racial crime by the 20th century. And in this way, black criminalization was essential, not symptomatic nor incidental to the ways in which crime and punishment came to be defined in early America. So I'd like to take a moment to thank the Gilder Lehrman Center, as well as David Blight, Michelle Zacks, and Daniel Vieira for organizing this talk and for granting me this fellowship. I look forward to the Q&A. Well, Crystal, thank you, uh, and I urge uh, all um, everyone out in the audience to fire your questions into the Q and A section. Please keep them as succinct as possible. I already have one question there, uh, but let me let me just start the Q and A, if I might. You're drawing upon, uh, as you as you said, an older scholarship and now a newer scholarship. I mean, criminalization, incarceration has been rediscovered as a topic in the past decade, to say the least. But there's this old prison reform scholarship, some of which I remember reading even in my graduate school, that was really rooted in this kind of social control thesis. Uh, now, how, how do you, I don't mean this just to be a historiographical question, but how are you finding your feet with that? Uh, by asking about new people, in effect, women, black women, children, black children, uh, how does this reveal this old idea of social prisons as a form of of controlling certain segments of society that are deemed deviant or worse? Because uh, because I don't think the new scholarship uses that term anymore. But I'm just wondering how you connect with that. Yeah, that, thank you. That's a great question and a great overview of the kind of changes in the historiography and the evolution of folks looking at yeah. this topic. Um, so for me, I've been really influenced by um, Jen Mannion's work and newer works that um, look at the populations that I'm interested in and was really um, fascinated by the kind of exclusion from the project of reform. So what does it mean to, to have social control over certain groups of people, but then to not even allow other groups of people to kind of be a part of, um, yeah. of the project of criminal reform, yeah. um, especially, and I found that, like I, like I said in the talk, I found that especially um, true for, for black girls who it seems are really slipping through the cracks of how reformers are writing about um, writing about the mission or the project of reform. And um, for example, like I said, some prisons aren't really even talking about um, that black children or girls are there. Um, they're not categorizing them. 
very clearly. Um, and in some places I found um, they even would say, we don't know where to place these children or, right. or people who are born into institutions. We don't know what to do with them. Yeah. So it was almost as if they were just not necessarily an afterthought, but just so, um, so intentionally excluded from the project. Um, mm -hmm. So like I said, I'm so interested in that, that phenomena and then how it intersects with um, gradual emancipation, because that's my first book is really looking at yeah. how African-American children are um, excluded from the project of emancipation, that they are the ones who have to bear the um, the kind of elongated and, and um, longer process of enslavement in the North. They're the ones who have to age out of, of um, freedom. So those mm -hmm. are the kinds of questions that I'm continuing to ask when I look at this project. Great, the, the questions are piling up here now. Uh, Serena Seifer asked simply about these executions were, are there any examples of white children who were also executed in a similar way? Or was, was this a singling out of black children? There are a few examples of white children, but for what is so important for me is age. Um, uh, the uh, ages of um, the children that I'm looking at, the very young age of Hannah Okuish, and indeed Hannah becomes the last um, woman executed. Um, she's not a woman, right? She's a girl. Um, but I think that that moment becomes an important moment in Connecticut history. Um, right. And so there are no other children after Hannah Okuish and certainly no other um, children of that age. There are a few instances of, yeah, of white children. And again, the gender dynamic too, right? These are mainly white boys who are a bit older and um, of different kinds, crimes of different natures. Can I ask quickly about this William Channing, that sermon? D does he convert that sermon into a justification of the execution? Or is it, is he, how is, I mean, how is he using a sermon? I'm just curious. Uh, yeah, it's more a warning to other parents about uh, how to raise their children so that they don't become like Hannah, um, an opportunity for her to repent. Uh -huh. But then again, we also see these very clear, um, these clear characterizations that he's making of her, that she, again, is wicked and beyond her years mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. shows no remorse. Mm -hmm. um, so I read that as a kind of racialization of sure. um, her childhood and her girlhood. So he makes it, it's a kind of a racialized morality play that he's using for other families. Right. Amazing. I, it makes me want to read that sermon. <laughs> uh, okay, here come, here come lots of questions. These are great. Every one of the questions begins by thanking you for a fascinating topic, fascinating talk, and so on. But Anna Mae Duane, who's a good friend of our center at UConn, uh, thanks you, and then says, she's wondering if you've come across language that explicitly describes Black children as unreformable, or do you find the idea largely enacted by practice rather than in rhetoric? That's Which a really a, great question. Yeah, thank you so much for, question. yeah, thank you for that question, Anna Mae Duane. Um, <clears throat> so what I have found mainly for the institutions that do not admit black children, um, the juvenile reformatories that I look at, they, they do explain why they're not admitting black children. I don't know that they use the language of unreformable. I think they actually use some language more tied to um, the kind of conditions of destitution. But this is also why I'm really interested in the abolitionist movements and their involvement in criminal reform, um, because they are involved in trying to get Black children into these spaces, into these juvenile reformatories to say they are reformable, they, they deserve to be members of society. Um, I do write a little bit about some racialized treatment also within these institutions themselves, how um, Black children um, are categorized criminally. Obviously, they're, they're also disproportionately represented um, in these institutions. And the labor that they perform in these institutions and when they're indentured is also racialized in different ways. But that's a great question that I'll continue to think about. Sure. Tamika Nunley asks about uh, 
black activism in these northern early American or antebellum cities, which were, you know, primary sites of black activism. You mentioned the black convention movement, but uh, she's wondering whether you find any evidence of these black activists getting engaged with this issue. How did they protest it and so forth? Or have you, have you gotten that far with the research? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. And some of this comes through in my first book, which does focus on mm -hmm. black activism mm -hmm. in the North, particularly black women and mothers. In terms of the, the criminal reform movement and uh, criminalization of black children, the way that I see them being involved is through kind of um, adjacent movements um, like educational activism, as well as their involvement in some of these other institutions like orphanages um, and um, reform societies and schools um, for black children. And in those spaces, and I'm interested to see if I find more in um, the black press and how they wow. talk about some of these um, some of these cases, but in these spaces, I do see them say um, that they will protect children from the kind of vices or exposure yeah. and vulnerability to um, to crime in the city. So I think the kind of um, racial uplift and respectability movements also form um, ideas about um, crime and um, criminal activity and encourage um, involvement in education and um, yeah. areas like that. You know, as you know, there's a, there's a big new online project about the black convention movement now that might be really beneficial to you i don't i don't know how Absolutely. much the black conventions ever took this up i'm not sure anyone's ever looked at that that uh robin bernstein wants to know about the labor of black children in these prisons and reformatories that uh, what you know how were they put to work or were they? Yeah, they were. So generally they performed gendered labor and this was of all children, white and uh, black. Uh -huh. um, the girls would do sewing, um, they would make the clothes, they would make um, uh, the shoes and then the boys would do some more skilled labor. Um, but what I did find, this was where I did find some racialized treatment that boys, black boys were the only um, groups of boys that would also do domestic labor or would be indentured to mm -hmm. indentured out to perform uh, domestic labor in the north. So that's actually an area that I'm really interested in looking at more at um, mm. that I do write a little bit about in my first book. So in effect, black boys were actually rented out or indentured out. They to, were indentured to work in the community. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, Marissa Jenrich asks about policing. Has your, has your research yet turned up anything about the role of policing in this in urban centers in early America? It's interesting Not how many of these questions are, are stemming from kind of our own contemporary moment, but anyway, policing in that period. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Well, I've, I've had this question a lot and I haven't come across it yet. I'm looking for it, um, but I wonder if it also is um, of the historical moment that it it just maps on differently to the period that I'm looking at. Um, for example, with the case of Hannah Okuish, it's not as though she um, was arrested by um, a police force in um, the town that she um, was sentenced. It's rather the the people of the town, the townspeople who gather, who observe, who kind of look into this and the court systems of early America. This obviously changes a bit more. Um, as we look later into the 19th century. But I was also very interested in that, that there are, there are so many observers who um, they're saying would, um, would remark on Hannah Okuish and who were there and who, who saw her look at the body and, and then wrote about what that meant and mm. how she reacted. So the, the, the documentation that I'm getting is not from like a, a police force at that time. Um, okay. But I, I'm interested to see if, as I move forward through this project, if I encounter some more right. examples okay. of that. Uh, Cabria Baumgartner has a, a question, but also a suggestion of, an, of another source for you. First, she asks, did uh, Hannah's status as a mulatto or judgment as a mulatto come up in the case at all in any way? But then she has a suggestion here of the, 
Essex County jail records. Uh, she calls them the intake forms. We've got a lot of people on here who have done criminal justice work. Anyway, the Essex, Massachusetts County jail records, I can, we can send this to you, from the antebellum period are housed at the Lawrence History Center in Lawrence, Massachusetts. And Cabria here says, you may really want to look at that. So uh, maybe Cabria Baumgartner could email you and the two of you could connect on that. Essex, yeah, thank Massachusetts you so County that. Jail Records. There you thank go. you, Cabria. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah, and to the question of race um, and the kind of um, multiple status that Hannah Okush has, I'm, I'm also very interested in this. But what I found was that particularly in how she's represented after the case, uh -huh. the, they're much more leaning towards her blackness. Um, she's uh -huh. more, she's increasingly represented as Negro. Um, she sometimes is mulatto. So the, the sermon that I, that I shared is, um, defines her as mulatto. Uh -huh. um, and they also, I think there's a kind of, there's certainly a class dynamic to this as well. Um, they're very um, interested in commenting on the lack of presence that she has from her mother who is also a servant and who's unable to have a kind of influence in her life that um, they find to be important at that time uh -huh. um, and that she herself was indentured so that's an important element to the story as well uh -huh. um, and then also for me as much as I'm interested in her her racial background I'm also interested in how they write and describe the white child, the white girl who is the victim in this case and right. the kind of stark contrast that they draw between Eunice, who is the girl murdered, and then mm -hmm. Hannah. So thank mm -hmm. you for that comment and question, Cabria. Uh, Tony Nelson asks about the white abolitionist reformers um, wanting to know if they got involved, if they tried to get involved in the sentencing problem, but also just about the general role of, of these abolitionist organizations. How much did they actually do about this? I'm, I'd be fascinated to know more about that too. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I found more in terms of their involvement in the sentencing of black children to adult prisons. Uh -huh. um, then I have so far, it's early stages, and I have so far in terms of their, their commentary or involvement on the executions. Uh -huh. They're certainly involved in, again, the kind of, in the tension between getting the Black children out of adult prisons and into juvenile reformatories, yeah. but then um, find themselves, finding themselves having to explain, well, are Black people, um, are black people more criminally inclined? No, they're not. This is a racist idea, but we still want black people to be mm -hmm. and black children to be in these institutions. So again, there's that really um, that really interesting tension there that I find with um, white abolitionists in particular. Um, there are at least two questions that are trying to draw you right into the present. So I'll kind of combine them. They come from Bill Bush and Alexis Williams, and the questions are, well, first of all, uh, how is this making you think about uh, childhood and our current carceral state, but also from Alexis Williams, um, the school to prison pipeline we hear so much about today, um, does your research thus far on this 175 year old story or, or 200 year old story, what am I saying? How does it make you reflect on any of that? Or is that just a present consciousness you're, you're not ready to tackle? I don't know. You're gonna get asked to do it anyway, so why not? Yeah, that's right. And I do think it's important that we, we kind of understand the, um, the origins of the criminal reform movement for what, for what they were, which was this movement which was supposed or was designed and described in such a way that was supposed to be benevolent, that was to move away from this, these capital punishments and move towards um, penitentiaries where people are institutionalized in ways that allow for their behavior to change, to kind of yeah. move out of the criminal status and criminal class. 
Um, and I, I do think that the literature is very clear on that, but what I think is less clear is um, the very moment or that at the inception of this, we have African-Americans who are clearly racialized um, as part of the criminal reform movement. And I think that my work, what I seek to do in this work is to really move this back a little bit further mm -hmm. than um, we tend to think about just kind of com contemporarily as we reflect back on um, criminalization in America. So I'm certainly um, aware of the kind of legacies of this in the present moment and suggesting that perhaps its roots are much deeper than we had even imagined. Mm. Well, our friend Manisha Sinha weighs in just with an, another good suggestion. She'd suggest looking at the abolitionist campaign against capital punishment. Uh, she says, great job with your talk, but but there was the abolitionists were concerned about capital punishment, and that might that could be really fruitful. Um, Norman Marshall, Absolutely. also uh, uh, an old friend of our center, uh, to say the least, says, lovely talk. Was there any attempt by white clergy to, in effect, rehabilitate the black child criminals, you know, in the wake of this? Maybe, maybe you're not to that part of the research yet, but that's an interesting question. Did they, that's an did interesting they create angle. any rehabilitation yeah. programs or... Yeah, I hadn't, I, I haven't encountered that angle yet. I will keep that in mind and definitely look at okay. Manisha Sinha's astute sure. observation. <laughs> wow, well, the, the, uh, that may be most of the questions I've been through now, but I have another one. You said you are using, or you have read or are about to use the now famous uh, Rob, or the Austin Reed manuscript mm -hmm. of The Haunted Convict. Um, I worked early on on that manuscript and then turned it over to Caleb Smith, who of course did wonders with it uh, and got it published. But has that been useful in terms of just understanding you know, New York prisons and you know it's 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 the first of its kind, as I understand it. You know, a narrative by a former prisoner. Of course, you're hoping to, to uncover one or two of these. <laughs> of these, these kids who then grew up or something, but how has that uh, read manuscript been, been of any use to you? Yeah, I find it quite fascinating. And what I'm especially interested in, obviously, is his experiences as a child, but also how he describes kind of moving in and out of these institutions and yeah. almost getting caught up into this um, criminalization, institutionalized crime. Um, pattern, which I'm really interested in kind of understanding and mapping it on to other um, African Americans, but it is such an invaluable document um, to have someone who's lived through and then describes um, their experiences being yeah. imprisoned, I think is just such a wonderful discovery. It really is. And thanks to, again, the Beinecke Library, who went out and, uh, as I recall, they bought that at the auction, uh, that's how they discovered it. Another question has come in, and uh, I think I'm, just, I'm gonna, it's a little bit longer, but it's an interesting question from Vanessa Holden, who says in her own work on slave rebellion in Virginia, she's found that white Southerners had to grapple with the category of criminal slave. Uh, this is the antebellum period, of course. One problem that arose for the white lawmakers was that they imagined criminal slaves to be black men, prime working age, enslaved women and children punished in Virginia as criminals, including children they had while incarcerated, sparked a number of debates about children's status as enslaved people and prisoners. As slavery gradually ends in the North, is there a similar category of the criminal slave? Do patterns of incarcerating enslaved people follow for, for newly freed and free people of color? I think this is getting to that last chapter you're planning, right. the aftermath of freedom. Um, but this also this category of the criminal slave. Yeah, that's such a great um, comment and question. And I think really gets at um, something that I'm kind of struggling to define. So that's really mm. helpful for me to to look to the South also to how this is happening. So what I what I do see in terms of how um, 
they're categorizing people. Well, one thing I can say is that a number of the people that I look at were enslaved while they were um, imprisoned. Uh -huh. And I'm really interested to understand more about that story. Some of them have escaped slavery because they they don't they they state that their their place of origin is not or that their fugit is not the north or that they're fugitives. Um, and that some of these are also children who perhaps have been who have escaped or been brought to the north and then imprisoned, um, which I think is is fascinating in an area of a, a much more um, development and research. Um, and then other groups of people who are um, who are are enslaved, what I find, at least from my chapter on children is that what I'm wondering is happening is that there's this movement towards um, towards these long term sentences, adult or lifetime in prison, um, uh -huh. or executions, partly because it's unclear how what to do with them, partly because they're they're working through this idea of the criminal slave, and because it's such a terrifying prospect, especially for these black girls who mm. are um, are rejecting and resisting their enslavement um, through murdering their enslavers. But that's a really, um, like I said, that's a really great comment from Vanessa. That I'll I'll look to the south for that. Okay. For some more information on that. Well, Crystal, the questions do keep coming in. I'll I'll, I'll throw one more to you. Uh, and we do welcome all these questions, but I'll cut them off here pretty soon. Um, Arthur Sudler asks about the Free African Society of Philadelphia and whether that might be a source for you because they engaged in a lot of uplift and you know, culture of respectability reform. Uh, and they did a lot of work with orphans, that is black orphans. Uh, so it's another suggestion, I guess, of sources and I presume those sources are probably at the, uh, well, there's several great libraries in Philadelphia, but I don't know, the Free African Society, I don't know, does that come across your screen or? Um... Right, thank you, yeah. And um, that actually, I think probably comes through because this is so closely tied with my first book that comes through with that book and my examination of the orphanages in Philadelphia and um, that I think that that's right that the kind of emphasis on um, on reform also becomes an, um, an avenue for reformers to um, admit black children to orphanages in order to protect them from exposure to criminal activity that's something that a lot of these orphanages write about um, and then at the same time what I see happening with some of these records of orphanages is then um, in um, as a result um, a negative portrayal of the free black, free black community from white reformers who then say we need to take these children out of these kind of increasingly criminal communities and protect them in these orphanages so then again, I, I see some of the tensions um, with between protecting black children, removing them from criminal influence, but then also a, a, a almost indirect and sometimes very direct criminalization of the black community itself. Uh -huh. Well, Crystal, uh, we're almost at one o'clock. I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna let you off the hook here. Although I saw yet another question or two coming in. You've really stimulated a lot of people out there across the spectrum. Um, and I, I just might use the moment to reemphasize the session that we're doing, I forget the date now, um, with the Yale Prison Reform and Carceral State um, Committee or, or organization. Um, we'll be doing a, a whole panel conversation about that in just a couple of weeks. Uh, so we welcome everybody back for that. And I would just say thank you, Crystal, because what you've opened up, this is not easy to do when you've just begun. I mean, you haven't written a chapter of this book yet, and yet you were willing to expose the work. And look what happened. A lot of people have, everybody's always got their ideas of sources, and you should, you should look at my, my project and my sources, and, you know, and so on and so forth. But, it, but we get to see a, a historian working the craft, you know, how you're beginning to think about this, conceive the questions, organize six chapters, even though they may mutate. Um, 
this set of sources might lead you there and, and how you're how you're how you're actually conceiving your questions it it was really a pleasure to hear you do that and uh, thank you for taking the little risks that go along with that that's it's really one of the main purposes of these talks is to let somebody present their work and see where to go next anyway thank you uh, so much thank you for the opportunity to do so it was such a pleasure and i really appreciate the questions and comments oh you bet and I want to invite, uh, first of all, I want to thank Daniel Vera, our media person that many of you may know, but probably never see because he's always doing all the technical work. I want to thank Michelle for helping put this together. And Daniel, I think you're going to put up a, a screenshot here. Yeah, let me just end by, by telling everyone out there, uh, the Gilda Lehrman Center is always raising money. I'm always raising money. And we're especially at an acute time in this process. The center is 22 years old. And uh, Dick Gilder, who was our primary benefactor for so long, just died last year. And uh, by this summer, I, uh, I need to raise a few boatloads of uh, cash. So if anybody is looking for an opportunity, small, medium or large, or any of any size to help us out right here on this screen, you can see our website, you can see where to, con to uh, contribute and how to contribute. And we even have a donate button now on our newsletter. So we, uh, we welcome any support anyone wants to give us. <laughs> Crystal, thanks again, and a, a special thanks and an encouragement to you and, and Godspeed because I just learned you and your family are gonna be moving up to the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Uh, which is a beautiful area of this world. And so Godspeed and good luck in the big move. And uh, we, we'll be seeing more of you here in the GLC events throughout the spring. Thank you everybody for coming today and have a great Wednesday.